And so uh, with acknowledgement to the Muppets, I would like to welcome you all here to the panel, to our panel on the topic of ESG in space. <laughs> Uh, so this panel will ask uh, whether ESG is a meaningful way to address both value and performance in space sustainability. We're seeing increasing discussion and application of environmental, social, and governance, ESG, strategies in the space sector, both as a motivator for incoming investment, some of the things Aaron was talking about, and as a corporate strategy tool to address sustainability challenges. How are space companies implementing ESG, and how can space help with ESG in the terrestrial sector? Uh, but before getting into this discussion, one uh, just brief housekeeping reminder, we are doing Q&A through the Whova app, uh, so please do submit your questions uh, in that app, and I think you're all probably very well familiar with that, but just that reminder as well. Um, the bios for the speakers are also on the app, so we're not going to go through the details, but I do want to just very briefly uh, introduce everybody kind of going down to my left. Uh, so John Janka is a Chief Officer for Global Government Affairs and Regulatory at Viasat. Thank you, John. Uh, Gareth Keane is a partner with Promus Ventures. Uh, it's a venture firm focusing on early stage deep technology, software, and hardware companies, which includes a number of space companies. Uh, looking down, we have uh, Brian Shenning, who is, turn the page, uh, the founder and principal of One Small Step, which is a corporate sustainability advisory firm. And previously, uh, Brian, you led the environmental and ESG sustainability programs at Northrop Grumman. Uh, to Brian's left is uh, Amber Ledgerwood, the Director of Social and Environmental Impact at SES Satellites, uh, where she is responsible for driving impact into SES's business aligned with the UN SDGs and focused on four pillars of space sustainability, climate action, diversity, and critical human needs. Uh, and then to Amber's left is Justinia Radelkiewicz. I hope I got that slightly correct. Uh, she is the head of uh, the section for Consumer Solutions, Market, and Technology at the European Union, European Union Agency for the Space Program, EU SPA, where she leads efforts focused on the development of space downstream products and solutions. Uh, and so we did have some last minute speaker changes on this panel. So John, Brian, really appreciate you stepping in in a last minute uh, role here, so thank you. And so with that, we'll uh, dive right on in. Um, Justin, yeah, I wanna start with, uh, with you. So we heard from the preceding uh, spotlight about the increasing prevalence of ESG strategies in sustainable finance and how some of the climate uh, drivers uh, in that. Um, in your interaction with downstream companies in the space industry and those that use space data and services, what are you seeing about the role of space capabilities in supporting terrestrial ESG initiatives? Thank you, Ian, for this, uh, this question. So I would just uh, say maybe one word about the USPA, one sentence about USPA because we are not so known uh, probably here. So in Europe, we have actually two space agencies, uh, apart from national space agencies that you have uh, seen before, but uh, two space agencies at European level, so ESA and USPA. And uh, the role of USPA is actually um, to operate the European space programs like Galileo. Uh, we are also working on Copernicus, the Earth Observation Program, and soon on IRIS. And uh, we are our sweet spot is to work with downstream companies. So with all the companies that are using uh, space data services signals and to help them to use them better and to um, kind of encourage the expansion of space to non-space industries. And in that context, we have been uh, working recently on um, how space data, because as our, my predecessor said here in Spotlight Talk, data is the key. So how space data can actually help companies monitor their ESG targets. And uh, you would be probably not surprised that actually satellites give you the best uh, data for what is going on in our climate and how it is changing. So from satellites, you can see how glaciers are melting, how temperature is increasing, how sea level um, is rising and all that. But um, it's not yet so much used and known that you can monitor these environmental impacts at corporate level using space data. And uh, the data availability is very wild, and it is actually to the level of corporate that you can calculate how much you are impacting space in terms of greenhouse emissions, in terms of your corporate impact on biodiversity, in terms of your corporate impact on uh, deforestation and so on. And so we've issued recently a report on uh, EU space for green transformation that is freely 
available on USPA website. And this is how I actually connected to Jan to promote a little bit um, this work because we have seen that only around 20% of corporates in Europe use space data today uh, for this purpose and the potential is much, much bigger. And uh, also not only to monitor the ESG, but also to impact the ESG. So to reduce emissions, to have a more sustainable supply chain, this is where you can use uh, space data and uh, signals today. All right, well, thank you, Justin. And I think as we go through this panel, we want to turn, kind of weave back in the relationship between what our sector does and how sustainability in our environment allows some of those, uh, those applications and services you're talking about. Thanks. And with that in mind, I want to turn now to the operators we have here on, on, on the panel um, who are operating in, in, in that environment and delivering some of those services. So, uh, Amber, I'm going to turn to you first, and if you could just kind of introduce us to the ESG strategies that SES has employed and kind of why they, you know, the motivations behind those. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me, first of all. It's a pleasure to be here and having this conversation. Um, I want to start with the motivations, if that's okay, because it, it tees up nicely after what Aaron said. Um, we started at SES with a CSR approach, like many of the companies in this room, many years ago. Um, we've always did good. We had a philanthropic approach to, to looking after our communities, and not, um, not too many years ago, we said, actually, what we're really missing is the purpose um, within our organization. Uh, people make up an organization, and people want to work for an organization where, where they feel like they have a purpose. So our CEO said, you know, purpose is, is what I want to focus on, and how do we, in everything we do, make a positive social impact or environmental impact um, in how we operate as a business. So that was the kind of the instigator of us starting an ESG program, and that was the motivator for us trying to build up a strategy that made sense for us and that was totally aligned with our business strategy. Um, also, it's just the right thing to do, right? Businesses are a part of the society that we all operate in, and so making sure that you're not just extracting, but that you're also giving back and being mindful of all of the stakeholders and the, share, the stakeholders as a part of your ecosystem um, is really important. So with that stakeholder mindset, we did a materiality assessment. We figured out um, where are we most impacting or have the ability to impact um, our, our stakeholders in alignment with our business strategy and what made sense for us. And out of that came a four-pillar ESG strategy. So we focus on space sustainability as the first pillar, uh, which I'll get back to since that is the topic of this uh, conference. The other ones are climate action, where we have a net zero goal. We're also doing science-based targets. We've done climate risk assessments. We've looked at um, reductions in our scope two GHG emissions. Um, we have a diversity and inclusion pillar focused on our workforce uh, and the diversity and inclusion specifically for women in leadership roles, uh, but also how we can expand diversity and inclusion within the industry. And I think we heard a lot about that in the other panels that we need diverse perspectives. And so I think it's, it, it, it's on all of us, right, to make sure that we're seeking that out and driving that through STEM education initiatives um, and other ways that, that we encourage diversity. And the last pillar is focused on critical human needs. And this is really where our products and services we feel like are making a positive social impact, whether that's encouraging um, education, health, uh, just ben general economic growth in places that don't have connectivity services as we provide connectivity and content ac around the world. Um, so that's, that's the fourth pillar. Uh, obviously, we do this in partnership with our customers, the governments that we work with, um, other industry folks who are interested in collaborating. Um, and so if I just hop back to space sustainability, since that is a major topic of our focus today, uh, we, you know, our, our desire is to collaborate more across the space industry so that we are driving a more sustainable space environment. This feels business critical to us. Um, I think as you saw on the videos uh, earlier by the UK Space Agency, if we don't protect this environment, then it will get too late. And I think Mark made that point as well. Um, time is of the essence, so we need to, to do this now in collaboration with each other. Uh, so obviously, we've, we are doing things that, uh, actions that make us um, more mindful of our own uh, footprint in space, which is, you know, getting certified by the space sustainability rating, um, working with the Space Data Association to share information in space, 
Um, but kind of the keystone project that we're working on is life cycle assessments. Uh, this obviously will go across all of our pillars, but life cycle assessments are something that are done in other industries at scale. And in this industry, we haven't done as many. Uh, so SES really wants to step out so that we can understand both the environmental impact of our satellites um, on the planet, but also in the space segment um, as, our, as is defined by you know, key indicators beyond just GHG emissions, but also looking at um, resource depletion, uh, mass left in space, um, acidification, kind of other indicators of environmental sustainability. All right, well, thank you, Erin. I'm hearing a, a reflection of the uh, people, planet, and prosperity that, that Aaron mentioned in, in, that, in that set of remarks there. So uh, some, some good things to come back to. John, essentially the same question to you. Can you tell us uh, about Biosat's initiatives in ESG and, and you know, uh, your interests uh, there? Sure. Let, let me start with, uh, with the motivation. I think there's really three key elements. Uh, continued and reliable access to space is important for nearly everything we do here on Earth, as you heard from some speakers earlier today. Um, second, we think it's just good business and good policy to ensure sustainable access for everyone around the world. Uh, and three, uh, we believe that the consumption of limited space resources is playing out at an increasing and alarming rate and we could go from there being virtually no problem a few years ago to being at saturation by the end of this decade. So seven, eight years from now. And as I think you've heard uh, from others during the course of the day, we believe it's time to act now. Um, so what are we doing? Um, I'd sum it up by saying we're, we're trying our best to advance the science and the awareness so that prudent policy decisions can be made by regulators and other influencers. And there's really three prongs to our activities there. Uh, one, we are participating actively in the development of carrying capacity models. And for those of you who are not familiar, it's really just an empirical measure of how much is too much. And this doesn't necessarily mean that's all you can ever do. It may mean that's what we can do with the state of technology today. But we need to work within the limits, and then we need to try to be more efficient in what we're doing so we can do more with the limited resources. Conceptually, it's no different than what we've done with energy. I think of, you know, I grew up uh, a little older than a few of you here. We all had these, you know, big hot rod cars with big V8 engines that got about six miles to the gallon, and we thought it was really cool. Well, it was at the time, because we didn't know any better, right? And now we're eking out even more performance in a cleaner way and getting more mileage out of our cars. So that's what we're focused on, is learning what the limits are and learning how to do more with less. Uh, we also think that the models that are being developed for carrying capacity are very important to assess the efficacy of various remediations and mitigations that are being proposed. So rather than just accept blind faith that we should do the following to fix the problem in space, we're looking for empirical models that let us take a proposition, run it through the model, and see if it really works and also see if it's the place where we should put our money initially. Doesn't mean they're bad ideas, but we can't pursue every good idea all at once. We don't have the time or the resources. Um, and, and the last thing um, that we're doing is showing why we need more than soft commitments to best practices. Best practices are great, but everyone's not gonna honor them, as we talked earlier on one of the other panels. So we need something more than soft commitments. We need a little bit of a stick. Um, and don't get me wrong, I don't want this misconstrued. Improve space traffic management, improve space situational awareness, debris cleanup, they're all great ideas. But those alone are not going to solve the problem. And we can't fool ourselves into thinking they will. 
And last, and this may be a little controversial, uh, we need to constrain the irresponsible actions by some, because otherwise all the rest of us are going to pay the price. And you think about what's happening in the oceans, right? We thought it was a great idea originally to dump plastics in the ocean, because it doesn't matter. And now all of us are paying the price for that. So we'd like to get ahead of the issues and try to use space as responsibly and efficiently as we can. So a few things there to pick up on, right? You're, you're hitting at the issue of metrics, right? We can't manage what we don't measure. It's a bit of a cliche, but it's true, right? Um, and then the, the question of bad actors that came up in the earlier panel, right? And so how do we um, have the, the incentive and the incentive the enforcement mm -hmm. structures to, to follow through on some of these voluntary commitments we're making? So some things to, to put a pin in and, and get back to there. Um, Brian, you're, you're next up on the list here. Um, from your perspective, you've been involved in helping companies establish ESG and sustainability, sustainability initiatives, both internal to a company as a, as a company employee and now as an external consultant. Uh, let's talk about this issue of, of performance and outcomes. In your experience, what are corporate boards and leaderships, leadership looking for in ensuring that these ESG initiatives are delivering you know, meaningful outcomes, both for financial performance and um, the, the, the broader sustainability goals? Thanks, Ian, and thanks for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be in front of a group of thought leaders in space and sustainability. Um, I think looking at your question from two different lenses, one, the established companies like SES and Viasat and large corporations with well-established boards and multi-stakeholder bodies and large number of investors. Um, the ESG space is really focused on bringing, as Amber said, bringing all of these great things the company is doing together and giving it really more of a North Star and a vision for what's the purpose of the organization, um, how do these all tie together. Um, there's definitely an activity around meeting the expectations of shareholders that will often drive a lot of what your focus is. Um, and so your value proposition is making sure you're delivering what your shareholders want you to be addressing, whether that's climate risk, human rights concerns with your products, um, the multifold engagement with investors and the things that they're interested to make sure that you're governing properly within the organization. I think ESG has really become a framework for describing your sustainability programs and it's a way to really assess and drive from a different lens progress on all of these initiatives, diversity, ethics, environmental footprint, cybersecurity, all of these topics. ESG brings a very unique lens, and so it is this collaborative role within the organization to help elevate those um, different topics from a different perspective. And so when you're looking at leadership and board level engagement, the board is hearing about this in a lot of their different roles and different organizations that they're participating with. And so part of it's just helping them understand these topics in context of the organization that you're working for. Uh, from a value proposition, you can talk about a lot of these are really just base culture. It's really about engaging the employees, having a workplace that draws the talent that you need in a highly competitive environment. Cost savings, mostly on the environmental footprint part, uh, but it's also risk management, whether it's climate risk, uh, being able to have a strong diversity and inclusion program. There's a lot of risk components to ESG that also are providing value proposition. For smaller companies that don't necessarily have programs in place today, it's really about understanding what is the business imperative, what are they dealing with today, what are they doing well and where are those gaps, and then helping really hone in measurable areas of impact that they can drive forward. Limited resources, limited ability to really compete with the large corporations and what they're doing, but it's important to start somewhere and start making progress on some of the key areas that really are meaningful to your business and to your employees. Some to your investors may not hear that as much at that point of investment, uh, but it's really about your culture and what you want to be establishing for organizations, but also looking to the future around regulations. Uh, we heard Aaron mention the SEC, even the EU reporting directive, looking ahead to what might you have to report on in the future, but also voluntarily through your customers. Uh, there's a lot of momentum for customer level engagement right now. The International Aerospace Environmental Group has stood up a working group to do ESG uh, engagement in the supply chain, and many companies are going to be responding to those larger operators. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to just manage the company well, drive some cost, and build culture through the lens of sustainability. All right. So thank you, Brian. Um, 
Gareth, we're not going to leave you out. Um, Good. So next question uh, coming, to, coming to you. So let's talk about the connection between ESG and investment from where, from where you sit in the venture world. Um, are you seeing ESG motivations in space-related venture capital, um, interest from the uh, limited partners and, and, and your clients, essentially, right? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to, to tackle that. So like Ian said, my name is Gareth. Thank you so much for having us on this panel. We're excited to be here and talking to a fine group of folks like you. So my view and my perspective is going to be quite different, I think, to the operators and some of the, the other people on this panel. We're driven by sort of our responsibility as investors to the companies that we invest in and to our limited partners, the people who give us money to invest in early stage technology companies. So our view of this sort of I guess the, the opportunity which is ahead of us in the sustainability frame is driven by two lenses, one from our LPs and one from our portfolio and the investments that we make. And we think there are a couple of like tailwinds which we're tracking closely. We haven't made very many investments that are sustainability themed yet, but I think most venture investors are focused on the technology dislocations that just bring efficiency to very mature industries. And you look at some of the major contributors to some of the challenges we have from a sustainability perspective globally, you know, mining, transportation, logistics, resource extraction of all kinds, agriculture. There are opportunities here for the technology industry, I think, to bring efficiency, which leads to absolutely gains in sustainability. If I can make a process 10 times more efficient, I can obviously become a pretty interesting company from an investor perspective, but I can be very beneficial from a sustainability perspective as well. From the LP side, we have seen that many of our investors, the folks who give us money, some of whom are on this panel, are very interested in starting to track sustainability metrics. And we find that frameworks such as the UN SDGs or some of the European Commission's approach to sustainability are becoming items that we often discuss in our investment cases internally in our investment committee and also with our LPs as we report out to them. We kind of talk about the investments we've made and how they sort of map to, to UN SDGs, for example. And then finally, I think there's opportunity for companies as we look at some of the reporting that some of the large, massive Fortune 50, Fortune 100 companies are starting to do. We often find that small companies are much better at solving those challenges around reporting. You know, figuring out technology directions or platforms that they can sell as an offering and hopefully become a big company and return money for us and our LPs, but also help large corporations and large organizations to track their sustainability goals. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, multiple assets, multiple ways that we think about sustainability, but for us, it's not a, a core thing which dominates our business like it would be for you guys at SES Amber, for example. All right, thank you. So uh, beginning to get some questions in from the, the audience. Thank you, that. Some of these are some, of these are some tough ones, so we're gonna get to those. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> we'll start weaving those in, but uh, Gareth, you've hit on something that I did want to start talking about, and that is, okay, let's take that we want these initiatives to be successful. We want them to be successful for the environment. We want them to be successful for deriving, or deriving sustainability outcomes, and we want them to be successful for driving financial results, right? Um, do we have the metrics to do that, right? So uh, I'm going to start with, with you and Justinia to, to answer that from a outside of the space sector perspective and then come to, come to our, our uh, operators here. So um, Justinia, Gareth, you guys interact with folks outside of the space sector. Um, are there established ESG principles in those sectors, non-space sectors, that we might think about bringing into um, our community here? So I think it's a, a great question. And I think one of the, the benefits we have as very broad technology investors is we do get to look across a really wide swathe of sectors, wide swathe of, of approaches to solving technology problems. Nothing jumps out at me. I mean, you gave us these questions a few days ago, and I've been kind of racking my brains. But I do feel that there are you know, maybe examples from sustainability in, I mean, Amber, we were talking about this at lunchtime, right? We've seen companies like Patagonia, for example, in the clothing industry, which is a very different industry to the space industry. But they've done some really interesting things in terms of how they track their supply chain, for example. And just, you know, we were talking a little bit about some of the challenges around supply chain traceability and how you're trying to maybe solve that with Copernicus data and, and Galileo data. So I think there's maybe some places where you can maybe take best practices from other industries, other sectors, and allow the space sector in general to develop pretty compelling solutions to those problems. That would be the way I would think about it. Well, from my perspective, I think that space industry is uh, as any other industry. I mean, the ESG framework is one, and we can really get inspired by what's going on on the terrestrial side. So first of all, I mean, when it comes to energy and emissions reduction, we have seen a lot of success stories. and. Uh, 
especially in road transportation, we are really uh, seeing the, the reduction in emissions, and this is possible. And this is where space could, uh, space sector could um, uh, also make progress. We've seen a lot of new technologies emerging when it comes to propulsion and so on, but also we will use less energy if we ship less to space. So there, is, there are these new technologies like how can you 3D print in space or how can you, you know, use modularity of space to actually have less load to, to ship and uh, reduce energy uh, in this way. Another area that we can get inspired from the terrestrial uh, use cases are the way, is the waste management. And uh, here I'm thinking about reusability of, of space assets, but we should not also forget about the ground segment, because when we think about space sustainability, we think about uh, the, the space traffic management and, um, and the assets in space, but we have also huge ground infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's not forget about the receivers, because uh, if we think of uh, billions of terminals deployed here on, on the ground, there could be also some re re reusability initiative, like, for example, you give back your old phone, you receive your new phone when, uh, when, you, when you changed your models, and this could also be implemented in the terminals, and it's not happening, really. And uh, waste management is also linked with the space traffic management, so I'm happy to say that a few months ago, USPA took over the European uh, space traffic um, space and surveillance uh, help desk, so we are actually helping operators to um, to be aware of what's there in space and how can they avoid collisions. So this is one. And um, yeah, and so there are, there are a lot of really use cases where we can get inspired uh, from the terrestrial. When it comes to the framework or principles, uh, when we were doing our study for this EU, uh, for EU Space for Green Transformation report, we've seen that there is not really one framework that all corporates follow. And unfortunately, the corporates follow the framework where they can actually look the best <laughs> in terms mm -hmm. of results. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've seen that you know, there are some UN tables that you can use and so on, but we really believe that the space data is the new trend and you can calculate the real environmental footprint and we would encourage everyone to dig into that topic. Yeah. So it's gonna be the operator's turn here. So. Um, <laughs> Something I've heard in there is supply chain. Right? I don't think we talk about supply chain very much in in this industry. Amber, I know you already, you mentioned that a little bit in your opening, right? That is certainly uh, an element of ESG strategies outside of the space sector, supply chain management, and how we apply that and bringing in the ground segment, right, is, is, is a good example of that. So, uh, Amber, uh, John, b both of you, um, as your companies built the ESG plans that you kind of integrated uh, or introduced earlier. Um, and other companies out there, you know, um, in Marsat, um, at the other you know, major satellite operators, you tell that they have they have ESG plans. Right, you guys aren't the only ones. Um, Maxar, who was meant to be on this panel, um, as you guys build these plans, how do we look across them to see that you guys are managing to the same things? Do we have the metrics? Were there were there metrics that you built into your plans? Do we need to do more to develop these things? Whichever one of you wants to take that first. Yeah. I'll start. Um... So we started with the UN SDGs as a baseline and a framework for how we can impact the world. Um, and there are so many other frameworks for reporting. So GRI and SASB and TCFD and um, all of those have lots of data points that we have to fulfill as, as a company obligation, inclusive of our supply chain and our value chain, so our customers as well. So when we report our GHG emissions, for example, that's the easiest example, it is not just SES sitting alone, it is up and down um, the entire value chain. So all of that exists as just a company operating and we're gonna get even more data points and metrics that we have to report as a European company with the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Uh, I think it's something like over a thousand different data points that we have to report as a company um, related to sustainability, depending on your materiality. So um, there's a lot out there, I think, in terms of where we could go with metrics. Um, to the point made before, I think that um, each company, based on where they operate and their jurisdiction where they're located, are gonna choose different reporting um, frameworks. And so there isn't an apples to apples comparison, I would say, right, right now. I think the CSRD is trying to get that apples to apples comparison for anyone in the EU, 
Um, and that gets to supply chain a little bit and, and a little bit to Gareth's point as well. For startups, if you are looking to have customers that are based in the EU at a certain, at a certain point, um, right, you're going to need to um, think about how you integrate some of those reporting um, and some of the sustainability principles into your um, sustainability as well. So I think um, there are metrics out there, whether we as an industry have decided on the metrics that we want to compare ourselves yet, I don't think we have. If you look at the different sustainability reports from the US to the UK to the EU, is all different. Uh, as far as who reports what and how you represent your sustainability strategy. Um, and when you look specifically at space sustainability, the closest thing I have seen into the gathering of the data and the metrics so that we can get there is doing a life cycle assessment, which is why we think it's so important to get that data um, and to understand the impact that launching a satellite has in each segment. So we're looking at the um, the satellite manufacturing, the launch segment, the space segment, and the ground segment. So how all of that working together impacts the environment. And by environment, we also mean the space environment. So I think starting there and starting to gather some data is a starting point. Um, but there could definitely be more collaboration around the metrics that we use as an industry to say what does good look like. John? So I think we're looking at it perhaps slightly differently in terms of the environment. Thinking of the environment in space is really having four aspects that are important. Uh, one which is the collision risk. Um, when, when you put up so many objects that are a certain size in certain orbits, do you reach a point where the collision risk becomes you know, unbearable and we find ourselves heading toward what one of the prior speakers you know, referred to as the Kessler syndrome. Um, another element um, is, is just spatial look angles. Right? Communication satellites use radio frequencies to communicate back to Earth. And historically, many different systems have shared the use of those limited spectrum resources by sharing look angles, right? I can look in this direction, Ian can look in this direction, and we can use the same frequencies at the same time. That type of sharing has existed for decades. It's becoming a lot more challenging when we're talking about 30, 40, 300,000 satellites in low Earth orbit. So trying to understand where we are on that limit. Uh, the light pollution problem, uh, folks have probably seen there have been a lot of concerns from astronomers and scientists about the reflected light from large numbers of satellites in low Earth orbit and the impact that has on um, astronomical research and asteroid defense programs. And the last one, uh, which is probably the least well understood, is atmospheric damage. Uh, when when large numbers of satellites are burning up in the atmosphere at the end of their short lives, what happens? They don't just disappear, right? They, they break down into small particles. And then the question is, what's the nature of those particles? And do they reside in the upper atmosphere for a while? Um, and if they reside there for a while, what happens? Is there a chance that they contribute to climate change through this radiative forcing? How bad is the problem? Um, do they do damage to the ozone layer? Right? We were worried years ago about aerosols and antiperspirants. Now we have a new threat of damage to the ozone layer. Um, so in terms of metrics, on the first element, collision risk, I actually think we've come a remarkable way in just a few years. Uh, there was a conference last week in Milan that was organized by one of the leading universities there, bringing experts from around the world to talk about modeling collision risk. And I do think people are converging. And the folks who are sharing their research, open source, are learning from each other and are starting to combine their models and make their work better. A lot of great people are working on that. European Space Agency, Polytechnic University of Milan, MIT, Viasat as well, I'm proud to say. I'm probably leaving some out. But the point is folks are collaborating and the science is advancing. 
So I think we're almost there on that metric. Uh, when it comes to the light pollution issue, um, I think we need more input from the astronomers. Uh, the astronomers need to be able to explain to us how much is too much and why, and then I think the engineers can get to work to try to solve it. On the atmospheric um, issue, there clearly is more work needed, uh, but there's some terrific work that's out there. If you haven't read it, I see one of my friends from Aerospace Corporation here. Um, Audrey's uh, colleague, Marty Ross, has written some fabulous articles about this and talking about additional work that's needed. I commend that to you to read. Don't take it from me. <laughs> but the last thing I'll say is we're entering a different world, and I think we need to look at it seriously because if you have 35,000 satellites in a system, to pick one, and it has a five-year life, that's 7,000 satellites a year coming out of service every year. Back of the envelope, that's 20 a day at 2,000 kilograms a piece. That's a lot of metal that's burning up in the atmosphere, and we don't yet know what the consequences are. And that's just one system. So long-winded way of saying, I think we're making great progress in a short period of time, but there's more work to do. Yeah. So hearing a lot of things in, in that discussion, right, John, what you're saying there, also hearing that space is an industry that operates in space, it operates through the atmosphere, and it operates terrestrially, right? And so we might have metrics from other sectors where we can think about applying to space's terrestrial operations. We're beginning to mature metrics for our own unique operating environment, and then that in-between zone uh, might require a, a, a little bit more work. So. Uh, something we can we can keep talking about here now, Brian. I'm going to turn to you with um, some of the start off some of the the fun uh, questions here because we do have to look at the critical side of this, right? And we do know that uh, for better or worse, ESG has become something of a political uh, issue, and and there's some some reaction to that, and there's some reaction to the ways we communicate broadly about what ESG is and and, and is not. Um, so, uh, from your standpoint, Brian, you know. What advice do you have for space companies about how to approach sustainability initiatives, ESG initiatives, in light of some of the political uh, questions that, that exist around the issue? The stand-in for the panel gets the political question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's unfortunate that it's been politicized. Um, I think ESG at its core is just good governance. Um, but I kind of think it's... In some ways, it's good. I've been involved in corporate sustainability for over a decade. And so I've seen the evolution from pure voluntary reporting to tens of questionnaires that come in from investors asking all different questions about ESG. To Amber's point, there's not a single framework, really, that can articulate ESG consistently across the aerospace sector and more broadly, even. And so I think some questioning is good. I'm not going to say that it's a perfect system, but I think the being political about it, I don't think, is the right way to necessarily approach it, unfortunately. Um, but I think... It is more focused on the investment side, the ESG impact investment funds. I don't see it translating to corporations and their ESG sustainability programs as much. But I also think it's a little bit irrelevant because the, it's so far along that I think any kind of political pushback right now isn't going to change the momentum. The EU is pushing so far ahead. that That's going to drive what mo most large corporations do because of their global presence. It's going to drive what they do for ESG, which then is going to filter down into the supply chain and even up through with customers as well, because the large corporations are going to want to handle this um, from the get-go. I do see, though, that even private equity funds are looking at um, how to advise their portfolio companies to integrate ESG. Again, it's just good governance. Venture capital funds are looking at what are some of those foundational pieces that startups should have to start thinking about this early on, it could be as simple as just thinking about diversity in your fourth, fifth, and sixth hires so you're not a all Caucasian male engineering company. So, you know, I think it's going to continue, and I think there's a lot of momentum that's going to be hard to really kill. I think if you want to be cautious to that, especially in the U.S., I personally like to use the frame, uh, framing of sustainability. I think it speaks more to vision, strategy, culture, and what your real impact is. ESG is really just the framework for context, for scoring, for disclosing. 
So that is really more of that investor nomenclature. So I would stick with sustainability. It's something you can control a little bit more. It gives you a little bit more leeway when you talk about your programs. All right, so Brian, you're not the only one that's going to get tough questions. You just got the first one. So um, I told you the audience had thrown someone in here. Uh, I'm going to start pulling some of those in more directly. Um, so someone is in the audience offering to go take a swim in the Hudson after the session. I think what they're getting at is that maybe the Hudson isn't the cleanest body of water in, in the world, right? And the idea that um, some of the companies that in the corporate sector are making these sorts of commitments may also be some of the worst actors themselves, right? So I'm going to ask the other four panelists. So Brian, you can take a, you can take a pass on this one. Uh, I'm going to ask the other four panelists, um, what do we do in the space sector to kind of get a, get, be more proactive about this? And how, you know, how do we avoid greenwashing in, in, in the space sector? What would your advice to our audience, those listening on, online, to you know, get a, uh, demonstrate that we're, we're doing things for meaningful impact and not greenwashing activities? So just whoever wants to, to go, or else I'll pick on somebody. I'll start just to throw it out there. Um, I think metrics are a good place to start with greenwashing because you can't hide from the data. Um, I love the data is king that Aaron said, right? I think that if we can get that set of metrics that makes sense for us as an industry, an aerospace industry at large, or even just the space industry, I think that would do a lot to help with the greenwashing. Um, and then transparency at a company level of where you are, not trying to you know, gloss it over. Um, and I think it, there's a, a piece of it as well that everyone just needs to recognize that we're all in a transformation journey, right? So to John's point that we all you know, we're, are driving gas guzzlers and we think it's great, um, that was then and this is now, and so you know, no more do better. So I think it's about we're on this transformation journey, figuring out what your hotspots are as an organization and where you can improve and being transparent about that uh, is a great start. I'm just going to double down on that. I think measurement is key, right? If you don't measure something, you can't improve it. And I think the, the idea of these metrics and what those are and defining them, I'm going to expand on it a little bit, though. I do think that, I mean, people talk about the whole classic tragedy of the commons issue with space debris. Like, it's not really anybody's problem, but it's all of our problems, so nobody really cares about it. I do feel that there's a need for maybe corporates to be a more vocal voice in, in driving some of the, the international discussion around space debris and helping us come to some kind of a forcing function around you know, responsible management of assets in space. I think that would help you know, define a space situational awareness, space domain awareness market for small companies and big companies. I think it would help to maybe get some of the international corporation or cooperation, which could take away some of the risks around bad actors, which typically are nation state driven, being very blunt. And then I think that would be, again, back to the metrics thing, a sort of a common playing field everybody can use to sort of track what they're doing from a, a sustainability perspective. Uh, for me, I see uh, a large, uh, let's say, role for this greenwashing avoidance in the financial sector, actually, Gareth, because I think everything starts with investment and it starts with a really great due diligence. And this is where you can actually spot some kind of greenwashing attempts uh, quite easily, especially that now there is so many uh, advisory services available in Europe. I don't know how it is here in, in the US, but in Europe we have the uh, two space agencies that really help the due diligence processes to identify from technology point of view, it is kind of strange or it, there is really some you know, reasoning behind that this can support sustainability. I think this is one factor. Second factor is also that there is a big increase in understanding uh, and uh, kind of um, um, need for sustainability from the um, employee's point of view. So if you really want to be um, sustainable as a company, you will be also very much scrutinized and kind of verified by your own employees. And there will be people raising hands soon that saying that, no, this is greenwashing. So I think there is a lot of this uh, transparency also from the inside that will, will happen uh, more and more. Yeah. Show me the numbers. Data. data, 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 data. We can argue about it, but at least, as someone earlier said, it's a fact. And then we can look at the fact and decide what it means. Yeah. And, and somebody can react to data and have their no. viewpoint, but if you can demonstrate what you're doing, then that, that data is data, yeah. Um, okay. 
Um, so there's a word that has come up, I think, in several answers, and that is culture, right? And, and so, if, you know, we talk about ESG, we were, there's a temptation to focus on the E, right? But the S and G matter uh, as well. So um, where am I going with this question? Um, what, what is the, you know, Aaron talked about the young people, right, and the, talk, and the, and the speech she was uh, given. Um, what is the role of, of culture in, in setting these practices, right? You know, as, as we have up here, we have companies that are, you know, Viasat, SES, you guys, uh, you, sorry, you guys are fairly mature companies, right? We have a number of startups um, in the audience. So how, how do you build this stuff into corporate culture and, and not make it a re just a reporting-based function? Um, I don't know, Brian, maybe look, look to you, start there. Yeah. yeah, I think, especially for small companies, I think it's important to really define your why. Why are you going to do ESG? Is it just a reporting activity? I mean, that's not exciting for anybody. So how does it really drive with your corporate purpose? Uh, where do you want to have an impact? What do your employees want you to do? I mean, that's a main driver for a lot of organizations. Um, for the employee perspective, the newer generation coming into the workforce and what they expect. So I think that's a, a really big thing to think about. Um, as you're going down this pathway, but I think it's really important just to think small and to find your impact and focus on that. Find your core issues for the business that by managing, th managing them through an ESG lens that it will really help you achieve your business outcomes that you're trying to strive for. All right, so some of you have been on panels with me before, and I'd like to do something, a lightning round, where I... Where I Can did I just add oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, as a very early stage investor, we 100% focus on the team, and the culture is a very important part of that. I think Peter Drucker back in the day said, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? So culture is hugely important in small companies, and hopefully you put the foundations in place in a small company, so as you grow into a large company, like a Viasat or an SES, you have the right culture in place. But the best founders that we fund are the ones who are passionately committed to solving the problem that they're trying to solve. And that is a very much a culture aligned with strategy thing. Thank you. So before I cut Gareth off, my apologies for that. <laughs> but as I say, I, I like to do something where I, where I call it essentially a lightning round, where I'll pick a question and point at one person. John, you've been through this with me before. You, you, know, how, you know how it is. Um, so I'm going to try to do that now. We've got about 10 minutes left. And so I want to cover, uh, cover a few things uh, rather quickly. So. Uh, Amber, we're going to start this one with you. Um, you know, as a public company, what are shareholders demanding in terms of ESG initiatives? Are you, are you seeing that um, from your shareholders? Uh, yes, we are. We get requests from shareholders very often asking specific questions, a lot of times around risk um, for ESG-related items, also um, uh, goals and targets, right, metrics. So do we have a climate um, goal? Have we evaluated our climate risks? Uh, what are our risks related to human rights? So absolutely, our shareholders are very active um, in asking for these things. Generally speaking, uh, it is a transformation journey, and so they understand when we can give them an action plan versus a, a, an actual um, answer, but the expectation is that that will be um, different in the future, and we will need to um, be able to answer their questions. Thank you. Gareth, you're next. Um, I've heard that investors from outside the space sector might be able to use ESG as a tool to know where to invest in space by helping them giving a framework to understand the sector. True or false? I would say false in a lot of cases. And, and yeah. why? I would say it's false because the space as an early stage investment opportunity is a, is a pretty specialized area. And we do see a bunch of more generalist funds uh, come in and, and try and make space investments. But I don't think they necessarily use ESG yet as a investing lens. The one place where it might be true is around the applications of Earth observation data and how they can go solve some of the challenges in certain sectors and certain industries. But I don't see that as being sort of a, a, a hard and fast rule. You can apply it for all early stage space investments. All right. Um, all right, John, this one I think is, is, is tailor-made for you. All right. Uh, so question poses that ESG increases costs. Let's take that as, as true. I don't know, but let's take that as true. Um, many companies will often not do it because of legal duty to shareholders to preserve profitability. So the criticism out there that ESG distracts from company profitability, not uh, drives it. What role should government regulation play in imposing some of these principles that we're talking about on this panel? Um, 
if you accept that space is a finite resource um, and you accept that it's a shared resource and you accept uh, what many economists discuss as the tragedy of the commons, uh, I think it's, it's inevitable uh, that regulators must have a role. Uh, because when you're dealing with the commons, look, if I'm the first one there, it's, maybe it's not a great part of human nature, but my, my incentive is to get it before you get it and to act in a way that drives up your costs of getting it. Um, and it's a bit of a zero-sum game. So if you accept uh, that it's really important for every nation around the world to have access to the space economy, I think it leads you to the conclusion uh, that there needs to be some constraints put into place so a few people don't overdo it and box others out. Okay, all right. All right, uh, so Brian, um, so there is um, an effort underway in our sector to develop uh, the space sustainability rating. And the idea, if you're, uh, you're not ahead, but it, for those that may not be familiar with it, it's a model that uh, companies could voluntarily submit to to have their missions rated against a set of uh, sustainability metrics. Um, we've been talking about metrics on the panel. Uh, the question here is, uh, is a metric like a rating, is, is that not considered to be good enough? So the question I'm going to pose that to you is, what are the role of rating um, services in, in, in this conversation? I think it's the SSR is helpful. It's only one part of your business, though. It's no different than a LEED certified building, Energy Star, whatever that certification is. It's just the building. It's not necessarily what you're doing inside the building, how you're operating outside of the building, what you're providing your customers, how you're dealing with your supply chain. So it's one piece that you can tell your story that you're taking the appropriate action when you're operating in orbit, but you really need a much broader framework to look at your whole business and your whole value chain of operations. Could I comment on that? John, you're breaking the rules, but, but we'll, we'll, we'll allow it. We'll you allow know it. me well. We're voluntary <laughs> compliance here. I mean, the one thing that I think is important with a rating is openness and transparency, okay. right? Folks need to be able to look at what goes into the rating, and again, data, 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 right? Let's, let's look at it, and let's validate whether or not it's legitimate. It shouldn't be a black box, is all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, Ian. No, that's, that's fine. <laughs> All right, and, and Justinia, going to come back, uh, come back to, to you. So uh, we've been kind of bouncing back and forth between ESG in space and ESG for uh, terrestrial applications, right? Um, can you just talk about kind of, do you see that, is that difference real, or uh, where does, where does um, that line lie? Can we talk about this as one set of principles, or is there a, a broader, um, or need to separate that? But I think in principle it's not different because the, all the, you know, parameters, KPIs that uh, terrestrial companies are tracing, the space sector can trace as well. I think what we can get as an inspiration is that, okay, it's good to have somehow consistent metrics, but it could maybe. Uh, be a good initiative to have some kind of, I don't know, sustainability stars in space. No, nothing like this exists so far, or I haven't heard at least. Maybe it would be a good uh, way to show some of the good examples and promote them more and, um, and to have it uh, really better featured. That, uh, that's something that I am missing, and maybe Secure the World Foundation can you know, start this <laughs> new initiative. Uh -huh. So, but in know? principle, I think it's the same. Okay, space is a bit different because it has assets that impact the globe, and I think that we didn't speak maybe enough on the S dimension, yeah. because in the social dimension, space is really, I think, one of the best sectors, you know, that will really enable global connectivity, that the space gives you so many opportunities, you know, that you are in the middle of, I don't know, like remote area, and you can still be localized, you have access to a map. I mean, there, there are all these great social um, benefits that have been created by space services so far globally that I think that, uh, that positions space a little bit better than other industries in, in some dimensions. So we should appreciate that also. All right, thank you. So we uh, can barely see the countdown clock, but I think we have about uh, three minutes left. So 
30 second, uh, where do you want to leave this audience with? Um, is ESG an effective way to deliver space sustainability objectives? So just move on down, John, and just move on down the line. Yeah. I would say necessary, but not sufficient. I would say that we see big opportunities for companies to come in, small companies, nimble companies to come in and try and solve some of these challenges for, for large enterprises. And we also see an opportunity for a driver for, I guess, LP, limited partner investor capital, to sort of be more focused on these issues as well, which is becoming important for us. I think ESG is not sufficient today because it doesn't really address space sustainability. It's an undefined component that really needs some consistency for how space operators and players should be communicating their impacts in orbit and what they're doing to be responsible stewards of the space environment. Yes, and um, <laughs> I would say that each company in the space industry should take responsibility for their impact in regards to space sustainability. Um, it, is, it is up to us to define those metrics and it is up to us to collaborate together. Um, and I think each individual company, if you have an ESG program that doesn't involve space sustainability and you're a space company, then you're probably missing out. For me, it's a starting point, and let's work together to have something more customized to space, but we have to start somewhere. And All right, so culture, transparency, data, follow through, and continue to, to discuss necessary but not sufficient. So thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you, John, Garrett, Brian, Amber, Jacinia. Thank you um, to all of you. So.